Baik, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil amya mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi syrahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa halun uqdatan min lisani yafqaw qawli amma ba'd. Alhamdulillah, uh, we thanks to Allah that we able to meet again today uh, to have our special guest and honorable Imam Muhammad Majid who flew over from United States uh, to spend three days here to have a visit and to meet uh, very important people, persons in uh, in Malaysia. And I think on behalf of Abim, I think this is uh, our, our uh, what we call an, an honor to have you here, especially at the headquarters of Abim. Today we have, uh, I would like to say welcome to our brother, Sekh Jain of Abim, Saudara Brother Ali Imran, and uh, all the leaders of Abim say salams to you, Imam, which is our president, Brother Fahmi, uh, now in Sabah. Uh, he has a program in Sabah, but Alhamdulillah, I saw his representative, which is his son, uh, suddenly uh, uh, gone. That is uh, Amir, uh, he's uh, the eldest son. I think this is the, the best way of Abim when the main person is not here, but he sent a representative from the family. And basically, I would like to say thank you also to Brother Hilman who arranged this uh, very important meeting session with Abim, which is in Abim, for your information, Imam Majid, uh, we conduct global uh, for Abim Global Forum which is this Abim Global Forum that we invited speakers from international, from outside, uh, when they come over to Malaysia. So then we try to slot in the session with them to have session here and to talk, to discuss about the important topic that uh, we Muslim and Malaysia can learn and can benefit from the origin country. So I think uh, knowing you, Imam, back to 2019 when I'm doing my fullback program and we met at the Adam Center, and we had a small discussion. Alhamdulillah, I think your CV, your resume, your uh, your long-standing uh, achievement talk so much about the development of Islam and how you motivate and you develop the community, Muslim community in the United States. So today in this series too, I think uh, the topic is about the Islam and Muslim in the United States and the lesson from Malaysia. Uh, in the context of the way how today we don't want to talk about the separation between one country to another, but looking at the rising of the number representative of Muslim, especially in the United States, either in the Senate House, at the state level, at the count, uh, what we call not district, but at the local council level, the representative of Muslim, especially the young Muslim, already accepted by the community. So especially. Um, in the Washington, at the Dulles area, uh, and as well as at the other states. So I think it shows about the good signal of Muslim representative uh, was accepted by the co local community, whereby the issues of Islamophobia is still there. The, the expenses of creating the Islamophobia also keep rising, uh, increasing. However, I think that is also not easy for the Muslim in the United States to tackle these issues. But I do believe that with the uh, compassion, uh, ihsan, as well as the understanding of the responsibility to create the good image, the great image of Islam and Muslim in the United States makes all the Muslim in the United States uh, survive, as well as, as well as that you able to show that Islam uh, bring peace, uh, talking about uh, coexistence as well as uh, able to work with others. So I think this is the very important message that maybe we can learn. Although Malaysia uh, been known as a like a melting pot of cultural mix up and so on, however, we also facing uh, similar uh, issues uh, regarding the the tension between the race, between the religion, and so on. So today. Uh, as I said earlier, that we feel great and honored to have you here to talk about the future of Islam and Muslim in the United States and the lesson for the Malaysian, inshallah, maybe between 30 to 30 minutes, we give you the floor to discuss about this topic. And then later on, we follow up with the Q&A session from our members here in this hall, as well as from our audience 
who watch us through the live TV of Abim at the Facebook platform as well as from the uh, YouTube platform, inshallah. So to those who are listening to us online, please post your questions. Put any question, inshallah, uh, our Imam will try his best to answer. But before I go further, uh, allow me to read about uh, Imam uh, CV first. So basically, Imam Muhammad Majid, okay, I try to make it simplify. But that is very important, which is, uh, I know him as a executive Imam, All Dualist Area Muslim Society or Adam Center in Sterling, Virginia. And he also one of the members of the Council of Religious Freedom in the United States. Uh, and then uh, Imam Majid also a prominent scholar who travel a lot inside United States as well as to the outside of United States, including Singapore and others in uh, Middle Eastern countries. And then uh, he has uh, two books, I think, very important book, which is book Before You Do Not A Guide for Couples, Reflections on the Quran and Change from Within. So I think these three books talk so much about Imam efforts to develop Muslim and uh, expanding the understanding of Islam in the United States where uh, uh, re uh, uh, in the facing of the struggle of the Muslim and Islam in the United States. But still, Alhamdulillah, I think Adam Center is a cornerstone or the, the symbol of achievement, big achievement of Muslim, especially when they have already a center that Muslim can uh, do their activities, uh, community can have a gathering, uh, weekend and so on. And also this center uh, reflects the identity of Muslim around the Virginia and Stirlings. Although they come from different parts of the world, but they can be a together, unite under one center of Adam Center. And even Adam Center, I think the definition also reflects to the prophet of Adam, where the, the, the first of uh, human created by Allah SWT, the prophet of Adam, where we come from him. And this Adam center also reflect the, that kind of understanding that all of a Muslim, you can gather in the Adam center. Uh, so without to further ado, I think I will give this floor to you, uh, Imam Muhammad Majid, uh, to talk about the topic that, uh, inshallah, please welcome. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. First of all, thank you for the generous introduction. And I had the pleasure meeting you at Adam Center uh, when you were in the state. Uh, youth are very close to my heart. You know, in, in, uh, in America, I've, I have a very busy schedule. Every time a youth camp asks me to come to speak, make them a priority. I spent three, day, three days with them because I do believe that the future of Islam in America really based on how much effort we put into uh, developing uh, leadership of our youth in the United States. Um, you know, I'm going to be uh, like highlighting in general what the American Muslim experience look like. So that maybe uh, provoke some questions and discussions. Uh, I like to engage as people rather than lecturing at them. Uh, I came to the United States in the 80s, uh, at the end of the 80s, with my father. God bless his soul. He passed away. He was the, one of the greatest scholars of uh, Islam in Sudan. And he was like a grand mufti uh, level. And uh, he came for treatment, and he passed away in 1990, as I said. And I continued uh, my education in America. And then I uh, been hired as an imam uh, since 1991. I've been doing this uh, now <laughs> way older than anyone sitting in this room. Uh, <clears throat> And my experience with Adam Center, our mosque, been an imam in this masjid for 26 years. Um, I served as the president of ISNA, Islamic Society of North America. Having me to have all of this um, experience in organi Muslim organization, I realized that this is very important for all of us as American Muslims to understand our history, where we come from, 
what people have done before us. One third of American Muslims are African American who brought to America through, during the slavery uh, uh, trade. And they are very significant in impacting American Muslim culture. There's seven principles, seven principles that we work or based our work on them and we take them as the foundation of building an American Muslim community. Number one is a principle from the Quran uh, of ta'arafu. It's very important uh, the, to apply what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Hujurat, Ya ayuhal nas, inna khalaqlakum min dhikrin wa untha wa ja'annakum shu'uba wa qabaila li ta'arafu inna akramakum and Allahi atqaakum inna Allah alimun khabir. Oh humankind, we have created from male and female, which is Adam and Hawa, alayhi salam, I met you into two nations and tribes so you may know one another, and the best among you are the those who are the most righteous. This concept is a very important concept in building healthy community and healthy society. What is Ta'aruf? Ta'aruf is not just shaking hand and ask somebody their name. Ta'aruf is a process by which you humble yourself, you make yourself vulnerable, to get to know the person in a real sense. And that's why Ta'aruf lead to uh, vulnerability. You know the, the process of uh, change, exposure, vulnerability, possibility, uh, actions, and sharing destiny. For it begins by creating an environment by, by which you allow yourself to be known and to know the other people. Therefore, in, in, in the Adam Center, for example, we have opened our mosque to people of other faiths. We have a very strong program that inviting people in, get to know them, we get to know our uh, local government, the mayor, the council, the school board, and therefore we have a very strong program of this ta'arafu, get to know people. And also, from within Muslim. There's something called interfaith, and there's something called intrafaith, R-A. Interfaith is to have people of various madhahib uh, living together. In Adam Center, you have a Shafi'i, and Hanafi, and Maliki, and Hanbali, and Ja'fari, in the same masjid. For when I came, to United said I was training in the Madhab Malik, but I realized that most of the people play behind me are Hanafis. I had to study Hanafi Madhab, you know, start all from scratch to know what is the, what the difference between Malik Madhab and Hanafi Madhab. Therefore, this is called interfit RA, because sometimes we focus in uh, building relationship with the outside of the Muslim community, but forget to build also strong bond within the Muslim community. What the ta'aruf with the Muslim community is that to believe that people who have uh, uh, different madhahib or different ideas within Islam has to, they have to be respected and you have to create what we call it uh, uh, open public square. Takfir, calling people kafirs, <laughs> fasiq, uh, counseling them, it does not create a harmonious environment. And that's why if somebody comes to Adam Center and sees somebody, somebody pr praying their hand down, they immediately say, why is the person praying like this? I said, this is Maliki Madhab. One of the four Madhab in, in Zunni even, and Jafar do the same thing. Uh, or if somebody see a Shafi'i person leading the Salah and do Qunut after Fajr. You know, they say, why are they doing Qunut? Because the Qunut in, in Shafi'i Madhab is something we don't do, they do Sujus Sahu. There's a Qunut in Maliki Madhab, you do it before you do Rukur. The point I want to say that we have created at Adam Center, I'm talking about my experience in our own mosque, that a very open masjid from understanding that we have diverse community and we welcome this diversity. The problem is that there's some people believe that they hold all the truth of Islam 
and people have none. And therefore, they intimidate you, like, you know, if you don't do this, you're not a good Muslim. And I said, calm down, you know. And it's really, <laughs> there's a big square here that you have to be open within that discussion. That's why Imam Shafi'i said, my opinion is correct, with possibility to be wrong. And the opinion of other person is right, uh, is wrong, there's a possibility to be right. Adab uh, al you have to have an ethic of disagreement. For that, the first principle, ta'arafu, get to know people. That requires humility. Humility. There's no humility, you will not listen to other people, you will not get to know them, and so forth. That's the prophetic approach. So, Rasulullah Sallam mastered the science, I'm just sharing you, the highlighting those seven points of theory of change, Islamic theory of change. What, what American Muslims have done, then they said we have interfaith, multi faith, work with other people, larger people, uh, the community at large, and get to know the, the Christians, the Jews, and the Hindus, and the Buddhists of America, because those are our neighbors. We don't live in Muslim neighborhood. Before you get to know those people. Then within Muslim community, also the, the diversity of ethnicities, not only Madahib. You have the same mosque, you have uh, Sudanese, you have Malaysians. By the way, we have good Malaysians. All Malaysians that I met are good, by the way, <laughs> in my community. And I have uh, uh, Pakistani, Indians, African, Arabs, very diverse. When you come to the Friday uh, Juma at the Adam Center, you see United Nations. Because this is what universality of Islam look like. This uh, diversity by design. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have created all people look the same. But he says in Surah Al-Rum, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضُ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ لِلْعَالِمِينَ It says, and among the signs of Allah is the creation of heaven and earth and the variations of your languages and your colors. Very surely in that are signs for those who reflect. Therefore, this is a very important principle. Because I know I have limited time, I'm going to go very quickly on the seven points. And if you, tell, if you think that I'm going too long, just stop me, okay? This is okay. I'm an imam. When you give the imam a microphone, you are at risk because we are called by the Jummah. Now, um, the second, before the ta'aruf, the second principle is the ta'aluf. Ta'aluf. You have to have the unity of the hearts. You had people to get to know one another, you build an uh, environment in which you engage with different di diversity of uh, madhahib, uh, ethnicities, and culture, but also connect with the larger community. But you create ta'aluf. What ta'aluf, what, what do you mean by ta'aluf? Then you find possibility of working together. Your hearts get connected. You know, yeah, yeah, you know the theory about the hearts and the mind and the hands? Do you know about it? Hand, heart, head. Head, heart, and hands. Sometimes you have to use the head because of the intellectual discourse. You know, fighting ideas, explaining yourself, and so forth. Sometimes you have to use the heart. You know, you open a door for somebody with disability, doesn't know your name, but their heart moved because act of kindness. And the, then the hand is helping people, reaching out to the most vulnerable people in society. If we take care of the most vulnerable people in society, then people are going to recognize us, whether that person is Muslims or not Muslims, because a Muslim is a person who believes in being beneficial and being helpful to all creations of God. Al-Sawasal said in the hadith, al khalq Allah. All human beings are the they are the dependents of Allah. And the most beloved among them, those who care about them the most. Therefore, this is ta'aluf, which is bringing the hearts together. And it comes actually of the ta'aruf. We get to know someone become we call uh, exposure, vulnerability, and familiarity become familiar. That's the aluf. 
And then you have this uh, uh, possibility of actions. Therefore, we're creating an a, a environment in our masjid where we bring people together every uh, once a month for breakfast together, eating together. Uh, we have potluck. We have social programs to create ta'aluf, loving of one, you know, being there for each other. And then we're creating uh, services, social services, uh, feeding the homeless. We have a clinic, free clinic at Adam Center in the masjid that provide uh, health services for everybody, regardless of the religion, regardless of the race. We have vaccinated uh, during COVID 50,000 people. Our message provided that. Now, the third principle, intergenerational, which is about you guys. You cannot have a society where second generation, third generation are not active. And that's taken from the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was building the Kaaba, who was next to him? Ismail. Because it had to be intergenerational project, otherwise, how is it going to be continued? With the for Ibrahim al Qawaid and al Baytu Ismail, Rabbana Taqabal Mina in Nakan Tasim al Alim, Rabbana Jamna Muslimin Alaka, and the Riyatina Ummata Muslim at Alak. That's what he says. Before Ismail Ali Salam was next to him, that he, Ismail Ali Salam, engaged in building the, the Kaaba to take a sense of ownership. You want the youth to be part of building society, building community, <coughs> leading the way of development, social programming, uh, taking honors, a sense of ownership of institutions. But that's what Ibrahim alayhi salam did. That's called intergenerational program. The, in order to have intergenerational project, the elders, they have to give space to the young. By inviting them to be active in a society, give them uh, uh, opportunities to shine. By putting trust on them. That's what we did at Adam Center. You know the first thing we built in the masjid? They asked me when they were building the masjid, they said, okay, we're going to build it in phases because it costs about $18 million. All of it were raised from the community. We didn't get money from any outside of the United States. If we have to build it in phases, the first phase, either you build, build the sanctuary, um, the place where you pray, the masjid, or you build the gym and you can use the gym as a masjid. You're not playing basketball. It's American thing, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's my point. Well, I told them build the gym first. We can use the gym for Friday, to pray Friday, uh, Juma, Salah, and there's a musalla for five, day, five daily prayers, and delay the other phase later. Because we want the young people to come and play and then pray, not at the same time, not at the same time, of course. <laughs> it's a joke, by the way. Uh, but, and we created a, an environment, what we call it a, a youth-friendly masjid. Come as you are, for Islam as it is. That's a very important, that's the slogan. Come as you are, for Islam as, as what uh, Islam uh, stands for. We're not going to change Islam for anybody, but we're going to accept anyone who walks that, uh, that door. Therefore, intergenerational means that you facilitate participation of young people and you create a platform facilitating it by giving them resources and so forth to be able to have full uh, sense of ownership of projects and, uh, and institutions. That's number what? You keeping the track? What, what did I say? What's the third one? We said? Ta'aruf, Ta'aluf, the third, intergeneration. The fourth, women-friendly mosque. Sisters, assalamu alaikum. 
women participation. Society that does not bring women in full participations is a society that would never flourish. Before at Adam Center, we made sure the masjid is friendly masjid, women friendly. Women have access to the masjid. Alhamdulillah, the masjid that I just prayed here in Malaysia, a very woman friendly masjid. Alhamdulillah, I see women coming in. And the other day, uh, I went to uh, went to a masjid, uh, you know, beautiful the Iron Masjid called Iron, and a mosque, and there was a big program for sisters. And I told them they said they've been doing that often. It brought a lot of joy to heart. I said they'd be very happy that uh, I'm gonna tell them that I just saw how much Alhamdulillah the massage is open for women uh, in Malaysia. For it's um, it's very important to have participation of women. And this all of this, by the way, take from the prophetic example of Sallallahu Alaihi the Medina society. Uh, you know, Medina and Madani, both of them connected together. Uh, the uh, and I, I didn't want to elaborate more in the Sira because all of you know the Sira. Just highlighting the points so we can have discussions. For women participations in in an Adam Center in level of governance and participation in society, uh, leading in many uh, institution, the the effort of integrating American Muslims to the larger society. That is uh, number four. Number five, we said that we must have strong economic, uh, financial uh, independence. And the American Muslims have created many institutions. And one of the well-respected person in America, Dr. Yaqub Mirza, whom I work very closely with, um, he really gives seminars in entrepreneurship, in how to manage your wealth, because Muslims have to have resources. We want them to be successful people in society. We don't like the Muslim to believe that you abandon the dunya. You know, don't abandon the dunya. You use the dunya for, for the akhirah. You know, sometimes people say, uh, this is dunya or deen. I heard that before or not? For the dunya and the deen. That's a big mistake. Is a myth. There's so many myths, you know, sometimes people use. Because dunya and deen, they are not enemy of each other. Islam wants us to develop this world. Uh, we call it Imran. Fiha. He wants us to have Imran and Tawheed and Tazkiyah. To believe in oneness of Allah and then you have purification of the hearts and then developing this world. That's what Islam wants us to do. Therefore, this idea of the uh, have this tension between deen and dunya is artificial, you know. Uh, a matter of fact, the word dunya has the word deen in it. You know that one now? The word dunya has deen in it. Yeah, the, the letters of the deen is in dunya. In Islam, we believe in the spiritual discourse that he encourage people that do not answer nasibak is in the dunya. Do not forget your portion in dunya. But become akhira oriented, but use the dunya as a means to that. That's why Muslims are, they, they were a leader in science. We are the one who taught people mathematics, uh, you know, astronomy, uh, architect, because we did it well. And some scholars used to be like uh, a medical doctor at the same time, uh, a faqih, like Imam Shafi'i, so actually, rahimahullah, one of the great Muslim scholars, and I know you him very well because you're Shafi'i madab, uh, he said it medicine. You know? Therefore, that is, uh, he came in track. Yeah, put you to sleep. What number are you in? That's how I give lectures. I want to see that you're awake. What number we are in? What did you finish? What the last things I said? I was going to talk about seven things. How far I am now? Number what? Number five. <laughs> okay. Well, number five was women engagement. Okay. Number six. 
we must and we have to to develop our own intellectual discourse what I mean by that as American Muslims we realize there's a lot of challenges including Islamophobia what is the intellectual discourse American Muslim have to, co to contribute to the well-being of the United States. What do I mean by that? How to preserve democracy, for example. Because if democracy goes, then Muslims will lose their freedom. You, can, you hear what I'm saying? How to address social issues, complicated, uh, complex, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a challenges in uh, evolution of social, I call them, um, uh, social norms. What is the Muslim's contribution to that? One time I was uh, asked to give a talk about the faith and, uh, uh, and power. Because there's a lot of now challenges for evangelical Christians and other group of people in America to the political discourse. For when I give the talk about the 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 idea of uh, how Islam believe that the public servant is actually hired and work for the ummah for the community, and how the community the ummah uh, held accountable the public servant. But all of them adhere to miss the same principles and same virtues of justice and fairness, transparency, integrity, all of those values. But we as American Muslims, we have to be able to share the beautiful teaching of Islam with the larger society. And that leads me to the last point. The last point is civic engagement. American Muslims are very active in electing public officials. Adam Center, every Friday almost, especially in uh, election seasons, we have people running for office, they come to Adam Center. They ask them for our vote. Yeah. The governor of Virginia he was elected to office on Tuesday. Friday he was at Adam Center. He came to Adam before he went to the church. Every major um, uh, institutions and interfaith group Adams have a relationship with. And the federal government, they send their representative from the time of Bush to Obama, to Biden, to come to speak to our community. I don't know if you remember, the Secretary of State, Kerry, gave a speech at the Adams Center about refugees. When we have Syrian refugees coming to America and people were objecting them coming, but he came and gave a speech and there was a, a movie star um, lady came to with him to advocate for the refugees, but they come to Adamson. Why that is important? Because if you pay taxes, you fund your government, I have no relationship with the government, is a problem. You have to establish a healthy relationship with government, not a negative one. And that's why, uh, alhamdulillah, we good news, Muslim are running for offices, and we have many of them now in different states, mayors, uh, city council, uh, school board, and member of Congress. Uh, Muslims are really become part of the American social fabric. The last thing I'm gonna say, I finished my seven, but I would like to say that Islam like, like a river, this is Dr. Amr Farouk Abdullah idea, like a river that runs in different land. Islam in America look American. I'm gonna explain this so that you don't have any problem in your website. 
اسلام اندونيشيا هاتلو كونديشن اسلام ان ماليشيا هاتلو كوات ماليشيا what do you mean by that اسلام celebrate culture therefore if you bring the Islam from outside of Malaysia and you want it to look like Sudanese or Saudi Arabian Islam or is a problem what do I mean by that cultural manifestations has to be from the land called Urf the customs and you have to celebrate the custom the Urf and you try not to impose any outside Urf in any community that's why I told them, as American Muslims, we have to look to the, our identity as an American Muslims. And when you say an American Muslim, that means we have proud to be Muslims and have sense belonging to the land. And that's called inclusive citizenship. Loyalty to the land does not contradict the loyalty to Islam. Because you have to love the land where you live. You have to have loved the land. The Prophet said, he lost Mecca, and when, well, the fact that the people of Mecca drove him out of it, he would not have left it. Then what did he say on to Medina? قال الله محب إلينا المدينة كما حببت إلينا مكة والله make us love Medina as we used to love Mecca. Because love of of Watan, love of the land is very important in flourishing of Islam. And many people do this; they, they disconnect the loving of the land and they think that is like almost like a shirk huh? it's not <laughs> well, it's very important for us to understand that that is uh, my sh uh, talk and so like to see if any discussions or challenges or disagreement actually you can disagree with me you know say so, like we don't i don't like what you just said and they don't have discussions okay alhamdulillah thank you to imam majid on the seven and light turning points that I think yes, uh, although at the end of the session that Imam mentioned mentioning regarding that loyal to the land is the most important pillars for us how to flourishing the Islamic values, Islamic environment in our own country. However all the seven points that mentioned by Imams are to me is a general ideas that can be placed, can be activated anywhere which is uh, Islam is compatible to places, Islam is compatible to times and uh, people, where uh, on top of that, there is the rest is on Muslim itself, how they see Islam can work with the people and how Islam can flourish inside the system that they live in. So Alhamdulillah, thank you for the first round of this session where Imam already highlighted seven points that I think uh, yes, really important for us to develop it in our country, although some of the points are already there. However, we need to speed it up or scale it up in order to uplift the status of understanding of Islam among the Muslim in our country. Uh, okay, for the next session, I think uh, we are open for the Q&A session. If uh, all the audience here wanted to know more about Islam and the future challenge of the Muslim in the United States, uh, where Imam already mentioned that, Muslim in America is uh, living in the democracy system and then which is that if they're against the democracy, they cannot survive. So I think that is applicable to another places also, which is Islam need to, in that way, uh, to interact inside the, the system, especially if you are a minority groups in that particular country. But if you are majority, you cannot use the system to oppress others. I think that's also a reminder to us. So please, any question from the floor? Uh, or maybe I can start first with the discussion. Uh, basically, I don't want to make it like we are only two speak here, but hopefully we can have some of interaction from the floor also. But uh, I think if I wanted to start first, uh, as uh, I still remember regarding the last point that Imam mentioned about the civic engagement, where the Dulles Mocks become every Friday, become a center of the people to, to campaign, something like that. And even during that time also, I had an event uh, where there is a gathering uh, with the scouts groups where some of the people also, uh, the Jews also came yeah. in, yes. And then uh, inside the mosque, uh, we can see some of the Jafari group also pray, make a solat yeah. in the dulas. Uh, 
yes, in the US, that kind of ideas are well blend with the Muslim society. Even when I uh, went to New York, uh, New City uh, Islamic Center, also same things happen, where they have a one small places where uh, Imam Sohaib Web also said the same thing, where this law, these uh, places are open for all, not necessarily only Sunni can perform their prayer, but also for the other group also can perform their prayer. Uh, but it again, when we go to the, this is in the context of minority Muslim Imam. However, for the majority Muslim country, you can see the separation is there, where Sunni have their own mosques, where other group also have their own mode, for example. It's quite hard and tough to 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 perform the same thing in one place. However, there is also another country that they try to mix with another religion. For example, where we can see some of the promotion we hear in the news in India, where one place they change from Muslim to the other religion, where Hindu also can perform their prayer in the mosque or Muslim can perform their prayer in the temple, for example. So how do you see this kind of trend between the segmentation of in the states where Muslim is minority? This is the, 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 the pattern for the Muslim majority country. Separation is the pattern. I would say like that. If I use misuse the word, I'm sorry. However, for the non-Muslim country, where suddenly they, in order they try to promote the coexistence, they mix up everything in one place. Yeah. So how do you respond? Um, I, I think it's a very important question. You know, global relationship, there's a global context. Every religion is a majority in one place, but a minority in another place. Like Islam, majority in Malaysia. But Muslim are minority where? In America. Christians are the majority in the United States, but the minority in Egypt or Sudan. When you say my, minority, this uh, numeric, numeric, based on numbers, but they are not minority in a way that they are less citizens. The idea of inclusive citizenship is that the person, regardless of their faith, should have a full rights in participating in society. Now, there's something very important, though, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he went to Medina, established something called the Constitution of Medina. And the Constitution of Medina had Jews and other people of other faith part of it. And the Rasulullah sallallahu said they considered them like one community, with the understanding their loyalty to the land. All of them have to love Medina, to protect Medina to do whatever it takes to bring about positive uh, change into Medina. That why the, the, that Wathiqa of Medina, or the Medina Charter, have we used it to create what you call the Marrakesh Declaration. Marrakesh Declaration is an effort, the American Muslims community has a lot to do with it, and then end up with uh, Sheikh Ben Baya and other scholars uh, that he invited to uh, have a declaration that ensured the rights of non-Muslims in the majority of Muslim countries. It's something very important that we have to be proud of as Muslims. Muslims did not force people to convert. If that was the case, that you will not have seen any minority of Christian minority in Egypt or Sudan or Syria. The reason that they have those still Christian there because Muslims allow people to practice their own religion. La ikraha fi deen, no compulsion religion. There's something very important also in, in the issue of uh, protecting the rights of others. Muslims, when they are majority, they have to protect the rights of others in their worship, the temple, the churches, synagogue, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, And Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah says this ayah means that Muslims have the responsibility to protect the religious place of worship of other uh, religious minority, to protect them. 
from not being attacked, not being burned, and not being uh, abandoned, and those kind of things. Now, the, our experience in America is that when we uh, had, a, had the experience of the uh, pastor in, in Florida uh, who threatened to burn the Quran, you remember that? Uh, American Muslims reached out to people of other faiths and they had a press conference uh, in National Press Building where the people of other faith pledged to protect Muslims in America. Not only that, they created an organization called Shoulder to Shoulder and they paid fees until, this, until today. This organization exists. As a matter of fact, this Saturday, they have a retreat in, in America to protect the rights of Muslims. Because shoulder to shoulder, standing with American Muslims, upholding American values. We have multi-faith neighbor network, for example. Myself and Rabbi uh, David Sipperstein and Pastor Bob Roberts. We established this organization because evangelical Christians in America have the most misunderstanding of Islam. And they are the ones who funded Islamophobia. For I decided to reach out to them. And we train a pastor, a rabbi, and an imam together in building harmonious society. And we ask them to do five things. They have to, have to visit each other home, not to go to a restaurant, to get to know each other's family. Number two, to bring the two communities together for social activities. The third, they have to choose a social service project in the neighborhood, whether it's uh, the soup kitchen, homelessness, uh, addressing the ho uh, creating a shelter, for example, for homeless, and clinic, whatever it may be, environmental issues. Number four, they have to pledge to stand for one another. Any group of them being attacked, the other people to protect them. Number five is to create a network for emergency preparedness, hurricane, flood, anything then they have to work together to address it. Now we are in 25 cities. Major cities, our goal to get 50 cities. What do, we, what do we do? We get those three people, we train them in inclusive citizenship and engagement, and then we ask them to do a program in their local by bringing 10 imams, 10 rabbis, 10 pastors. Those three people, they're going to host it. So you can spread it in the neighborhood. It bears fruit. I give an example. In Seattle, uh, in Washington uh, State, a Islamophobe person came and burned the masjid at night, burned the masjid to the ground. While the, the masjid is on fire, the pastor from that uh, community brought the keys of his church and handed over to the imam, says, the church is yours. He's one of the pastors that we trained. This guy will not have done this before he get to know the imam. You know, you know the first retreat? The first retreat we brought 12 imams until 12 evangelical pastors. Because I challenged the pastor that was doing a program with me in Nepal. I said, you care about Christian minorities in the majority of Muslim countries, but don't, you don't care about Muslims in America. I said, I challenge you when you come to America, bring your people and my people, let them sit together so that your people can change their mind about us. We brought 12 of them, 12, 12 pastors, 12 imams. The 12 pastors, they said, we don't want like our picture to be taken with Muslims because we're afraid they're going to lose our congregation. We need to do quietly under the radar. After the three days, they said, they said, the pastors, you can take our pictures, you can come to our home, because they get to know the imams. And now, alhamdulillah, they said it spread around the United States, and we also do it globally as well. Did I answer your question? All right. Thank you to Imam for the response. Uh, it shows about the sincerity is on top of all the activities and efforts made by a Muslim American. So I think we have one question from the Facebook. Uh, let me read here uh, from Brother Shahab, I think. The name Aishi Shahab. Salam. 
how do we Muslim in Malaysia protect from unwanted foreign so-called ulama or da'i like propagating additional teaching, especially the Habaib Clement? You know? Listen, do not mention people by name. I, I you know, first of all, there's a, there's a global Islam. Like I'm talking to you now, I'm from outside. You invited me to come to speak, okay? If somebody followed by Turk and Madhab or a group of people inviting a scholar to come, welcome. What's wrong with that? The only problem that I have in America, I told the ulama, which is some of them the greatest scholars that I respect very much, we tell them that our problem that the fatwa that comes from overseas, that does not recognize the local uh, you know, customs and local issues. But when you send a photo from overseas to America and you're sitting in Sudan, you are completely disconnected from the reality. But other than that, if you bring Sudanese reciter of Quran to come to recite Quran in America, why not? You bring somebody to give a good talk to soft on the heart, why not? But the, the fatwa is a problem. You know, there are the three principles that you have to know in order to be effective imam or scholars in your communities. What are they? Understanding the text. Have access to the text. The second, understanding context. If you don't know context, so call orphan customs, you will not be able to connect the text to the context. The third, the application of the text to the context. You have to know how to apply the text to the context. Because text without context is pretext. You know that? You know? Therefore, it's very important for a person to know the society they live in. Can I give you an example very quickly? You read in the Quran, Musa and Al Khidr, alayhi salam. Musa, alayhi salam, he's a, uh, he's a prophet of Allah that Allah talked to him directly. He knew the Sharia, he knew the text, his text. But he didn't know the context of Al-Khidr alayhi salam. Well, both of them want to achieve justice. Huh? But the justice of Musa alayhi salam coming from different background, he didn't understand the reality of Al-Khidr alayhi salam. Well, he said, this is wrong, this is wrong. He said, no, 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 you don't know. And later he explained it to him. Therefore, sometimes even the activists, forget about the scholars, the activists of America, they cannot come and try to teach you activism in Malaysia. They can teach you, how, they can talk about theory of change. But you have to teach them what um, the needs here in this country and how you're going to approach it for context, 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 context. And in context, you have to have gradual change. Change does not happen overnight. There's principles of change. Number one, has to be authentic. Has to be inclusive. Has to be gradual. Change that over sudden is going to fail. You're going to have resistance. It has to be gradual change. Some people think, think that people have the Asa Musa. You know what Asa Musa is? The staff of whom? Of Musa alayhi salam. You know, you don't have that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even have Musa to use the, the staff after a while. The stick. Having to use the stick when he was cornered. But before that, they went through struggle. What is very important for anyone who believes in change to realize that change happens gradually, it doesn't happen overnight. And a scholar from outside cannot impose on society how to change. Because sometimes people come in and say to me at, at, in, in America, SubhanAllah, I saw a youth coming to the masjid who was not wearing proper clothing. I said, leave them alone. I said, Astaghfirullah. I said, hold your horse. You don't know what this young person going through. Mental health, maybe come from a dysfunctional family. Maybe the first time come to the masjid. Because you have youth, uh, you know, going through mental health struggle, it's coming to suicide. And when the people, I call them the religious police. Religious police are very dangerous. Has to be off the masjid. Because they are the one who pushing people away, you know? You cannot have that. Let, let people come in. 
if the message is for the perfect person, then there is not a message. A message is supposed to be for someone who wants to change. Imagine if Rasulullah Sallam said, you have to be Muslim first to come to the masjid. You have to be this level of practice you have to come to the masjid. That's not the purpose of the masjid. The masjid is supposed to be for everybody. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Imam, for the response. Is there any, any other questions? No, only one. All right. So I open for the floor here inside of the room. If you have any questions, they would like to get further clarification from the Imam Majid regarding Islam and Muslim in the U.S. or another issue maybe Imam also can answer, inshallah. The single people here, I want you to read my book before you tie the knot. Huh. Before you get married, huh? read that book. It will help you. I have, to, I have to make a joke about single people. I, I do that all the time. Maybe I don't know the culture here. Should I make those kind of joke or not? <laughs> it's okay. Because usually in Malaysia, single people will show themselves. Okay, any questions from the floor? We have students here from UCM, and then I saw this from UKM. Is it correct? Yes. And then we have also from IAUM. Hmm. Former student from IAUM. You don't have to ask the question. You can challenge. Yeah, yeah, you can challenge. Yeah. You can challenge me. The people who have negative view of Islam are the evangelical Christians. And the people who have the most negative influence, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, misunderstanding of Islam are the pastors. That's why we're working on them. We're talking to them. So you see, there is the strategy of da'wah. So you have to know which people that you know how to take on. All right, good questions. Thank you, brother. From others, please. Any question from women, female participant here? Because Imam mentioned about the Muslim-friendly mosques. Yes, uh, I'm not really sure. The love is, uh, is it true that we mosque is friendly or not? <laughs> Yeah, please. Just a simple question. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, my name is Sister Balkis. I just want to ask, um, it's regarding uh, Palestinian Palestinian issue. So um, we know that um, uh, um, in Muslim, we have. Um, I I just want to know, is there any challenges uh, for you and for Adam Center when you want to, like for example, to raise awareness on Palestinian issue, especially when you are in a country that opposes this. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Palestinian issue very important for American Muslims. Uh, we have, alhamdulillah, um, a coalition that involve people of other faith, advocating for the rights of their brothers and sisters in Palestine. The situation is very horrible in Gaza. Before we had fundraising, uh, this fund. For Gaza, our mosque raised about half a million dollars. Uh, we use the United Nations to give the money. Uh, also, they, every day there is a prayer in the mosque for the uh, for brothers and sisters in Gaza. 
they they make phone calls the representative congress a member of congress uh people people protest on the street you know um also we addressing the issue of islamophobia and anti-semitism as well because both communities are suffering on campuses therefore we are uh seeing the increase of attack and muslim student uh because they uh speak in the issue of the rights of our brothers in palestine and we are working with local communities to address issue of islamophobia a matter of fact uh, there's a strategy announced at the white house of the issue of islamophobia and uh, led by one of the uh, american muslims uh, leader uh, because there's increase of incidents of Islamophobia on campuses, especially university campuses and public school. Myself, I met with uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, we met with the Secretary of Education uh, in the United States. Also, we met with the local government as well. But we are addressing those issues. It's a challenge, very uh, and a real challenge for American Muslims. Zoho, thank you for your uh, sharing. I think the first uh, you give seven principles is very good for our guidance, especially to run the Muslim organization. And then um, I'm referring to your first and second point, which is your first and second uh, principle, ta'aruf and ta'aluf. Uh, yep, uh, I think the difference between Malaysia and uh, United States is uh, the majority of Muslim uh, among the society. Uh, in Malaysia, we are majority, and and we are if we are looking the context of uh, Malaysian Muslim, uh, there is one situation. Uh, I, I would I would I would like to ask your 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 opinion regarding this situation, which is uh, since that we are majority uh, here in Malaysia. And some of group of Muslim, they have their own understanding towards Islam, and some of them is quite extreme uh, or wulu, and and we are facing the situation which uh, they are believe that the the only uh, Islam that can uh, be referred by the society is the Islam that bring by them, uh, so they start to judge the others group of Muslim. There is a different way of Islam, especially it is happened to the political uh, to the political groups. Uh, that uh, there is that it is uh, so they they are really uh, exclusive uh, on bringing Islam towards the society. Uh, so this is my question. Uh, maybe you can share your thought regarding this matter. The second one seems that you are sharing about the Adam Center that you are run, you and your team running in uh, United States is a very great, uh, a very I think is a successful uh, project to bring up uh, Islam towards the United States uh, society. Uh, maybe uh, you can share with us uh, or elaborate more. I think that uh, you 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 give to us. Uh, the which one? Uh, the fifth point uh, about the strong economic financial independence. Uh, maybe you can share more how 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 uh, the Muslim society in your place figure out uh, to to have a very strategic economic uh, strategy to independently finance uh, the operation of the center for the Islamic uh, growth. Thank you. Uh, um, first, let's address the issue of the ethic of disagreement. You know, let me give you a theory. The theory is called water bottle theory. I don't know if you've heard of it. If there's a little water in this bottle here, it will make noise. But if it's full, it will not make noise. Little knowledge is very dangerous. 
little knowledge is very dangerous. Especially if a person believes that with their little knowledge, they have all the knowledge. And they believe that the whole Islam being summarized on them. And they have the exclusive truth of Islam. Those people don't read the Islamic history. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, was a, a, a teacher of Imam Shafi'i. Do you know that? And Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, created his own madhab. Imam Malik did not tell him that you cannot do that. We were very proud of him. But what Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, said about Imam Malik, قال مالك أستاذي وعنه أخذت العلم. He said, Malik is my teacher. And I have taken my knowledge from him. He said he is my evidence for anything I do as a Muslim before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This is Malik versus Shafi'i. Hanbali. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimullah, is a student of Imam Shafi'i. He used to make dua for Imam Shafi'i every salah. His son Abdullah, he said, Oh, my father, who is the Shafi'i that he make dua always for him? He said, my son Shafi'i was like the sun to the wall and the health to the body. What Imam Shafi'i said about Rahman al Hanbal? He said, I Iraq. I left Iraq and there's no person have piety and knowledge more than Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Right? Furthermore, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, used to receive Hamad, the son of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and would have him sit next to him. And he used to ask him, what your father said about this issue? What your father have said about this issue? The, the, the two students of Abu Imam Abu Hanifa, one known, is Abu Yusuf and Muhammad Hassan al-Shaybani. Muhammad Hassan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah, the one who narrated Muwatta' Malik, the first comparative book of fiqh. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, used to visit, visit Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, rahimahullah. You can say even of al-Bid, alayhi wasalam. He used to visit him, and he said, every time I visit him, we'll take the pillow and insist to put it under me. This football thing, it is an idea came out of egos. We need to humble ourselves. You know, there's something called Sukuk al Kufran. Huh? It used to be Suzuk al Kufran. You know, Sukuk al Kufran? There's a term that I created. <laughs> <laughs> that people have, you know, like you play, well, you play, you play soccer here, don't you? When the referee give you a yellow card, what that means? Warning. There's some Muslim do that. They give you yellow and they give you the red. Red, you're, you're kafir. Yellow, you're fasik. You know? And, and they give you, like, you open your mouth, they give you yellow. And then if you argue with them, they give you red. You're out of Islam. You know, the problem is the following. When people come to believe that they're jama'ah, has to be jama'ah that you have to recruit people to. And in doing so, they become unethical. You sh I believe in market of ideas, market of ideas. Bring your idea, bring mine. But don't say that my idea, in order to market yours, you cancel me. You know, this cancel culture. Social media, cancel culture. Kafir, fasak, kafir, fasak, out of Islam. What is this? Yeah, look. You get me excited because this is one of the topics that I talk about, a lot about it. You know, people don't realize the Sahaba alayhim, have disagreed among each other. And they respected the, the fiqh opinions of each other. People of today, they are really not following this beautiful model of the previous scholars. 
او في امام شافعي احمد بن حنبل هو فولو ذا صحابه رضي الله عليهم هو ديس اجري اون ان ديفرنت ماترز ذات وي هاف فيري ريتش فقه بيكوز اوف ذات ناو ذا دينجر از ذات وين بيبول يوز ذا ريليجيوس اوبينيون تو تراي تو شت داون كونفرسيشن intimidating people rally the mobs against somebody that's very dangerous you know one time a, a young man came to me he said you know imam i don't know if this salah is valid of this imam who led us in salah i said why he said you know He met Qunud, the Imam of Shafi'i. Met Qunud and he made something extra in Salah. Before I'm going to repeat my Salah, I said, hold, hold, hold it. Do you know this within Islam? He said, what Islam? I said, the Islam that you and I practice. That's something called Shafi'i. You heard of Imam Shafi'i? He said, no. I said, sit down. Let me teach you who the Imam Shafi'i was. And I told him Imam Shafi'i, went and led people in Salah in the Masjid of Ahnaf and did not do Qunut. You have to learn that this is act of worship that this Imam have done has roots in Islam. The problem is that people don't read. And if they don't read, sometimes because they want to prove the other people wrong, and ego and arrogance come in their way, they will not humble themselves. Regarding the other issue that you mentioned, uh, financial independence. Why an American Muslims like Adam Center insisted to build the masjid with our own money and to sustain it with our own money? We don't want influence of anyone from outside because the person have the money, have the control. Well, American Muslims said we're going to build our own masjid. We're going to fund them. We're going to sustain them. Now we're building three masjid. Now each one of them will cost about uh, seven million dollars, total about uh, twenty-five million dollars, and we raise the money ourselves. But we're encouraging businesses. We have business council. Now our own masjid. We're encouraging people to come to introduce themselves to the community. If you're a medical doctor, we need to know about you. If you're a dentist, dentist, if you are in uh, uh, trade, international trade, we'd like to know about you so that we can benefit one another. We create a network of business people. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the Can give.
something like that that happened to some of society but not no. a common practice yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I i don't think you should uh, a person should use a lean age to become rich <laughs> you don't do that sorry all right so another last question i think shahe yeah you boleh cakap bahasa melayu nanti we can just you you can speak cakap bahasa melayu then uh, ana akan translate into english kalau ada soalan uh, ah yeah, ya aiman please person or a group of people that or a new convert of islam or we, we call it muallaf suddenly as they or he or she want to leave islam so uh, in your opinion what is the best strategy of dakwah or how we can handle or help he or she uh, to not leave islam um in in adam center we have something called new muslim care we care about the new Muslims who have the social programs, educational programs, economic programs. Because when people leave Islam, uh, leave the, when enter Islam, they really have changed a lot in their life. You know, I'll give you a very interesting story. At 17 years old, accepted Islam at Adam Center in the 90s, no, beginning of 2000. But the family kicked him out of the house. For another young guy, invited him to stay with him at his home. This young man, he is very amazing in, in his salah. He entered Islam and found his sweetness in salah. He made long sujood. For his family says, maybe this son of ours, we can bring him back and confuse him so he can leave Islam. They brought him so he can come back home. Before they did all the research on the internet, before they prepared um, questions for him. But women in Islam, jihad, all kind of Islam and terrorism. And they said, answer those questions. He said, I don't have the answer, I'll come back to you. He came to me, sat down, he says, I have a question for you, Imam. He gave me the list. I said, okay, I'll answer them for you. He said, please, before you answer the questions, I want to tell you something. This question is not for me. It's for my mother and for my sister. I swear by Allah, he said. Uqsum billah, he said, I swear by Allah. I have no doubt about Islam. I feel the sweetness in my heart in my sujood. I'm not confused. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give some of this sweetness of my heart about Islam to my mother, to my sister, they will have accepted Islam and they will not have asked me those questions. Subhanallah, this man very sincere. He brought his mother to Islam. He brought his sister to Islam. He brought his father to Islam. The entire family took some times. And then he took his mother with him to Jordan. They learned Arabic together, Arabic language. His mother put hijab on. I met him in Hajj recently, because now he teaches in Kuwait. I told him, uh, his name, he called himself Zakaria now, his name is Zah. I said, Zakaria, now it's been like more than 23 years to be Muslim, can you tell me what you told me in my office that day? I didn't elaborate, you know, we didn't del deliberate and elaborated on, on the issue of the sweetness. How do you get into this sweetness? He said to me, the first salah I prayed, I said to Allah, this salah is going to make me either stay Muslim or leave Islam. Will Allah make it easy for me to pray on time? and make me have the sweetness in my salah. He said, after that, he never the sweetness left, left his heart. For a person coming to Islam, there are three things to do for them. Love them. Teach them gradually. 
Don't give them a list of things that complicate their life. One thing at a time. And the third, when they under pressures and confusions and so forth, don't jump to conclusion that doubt in their Islam. Tell them it's okay to ask those questions. It's okay to be confused. You know, we just you new Muslims. Give them comfort. Because when people said, Oh, you asking this question, you're not a good Muslim. Uh what you have doubt about Islam. And Islam said, oh, it's okay. You know, we learned through the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the angel to ask him a question. Even angel ask. He said, they, said to, so they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would you create someone who would shed the blood and spread uh, corruptions? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them to ask a question to teach us that if the angel can ask. Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Rabbi Ali kayfa tuhin mawta. Ask me how you bring the Ibrahim doubted Allah? No. Qala wa lam tu'min? Qala bala wa lakin liyatmain qalbi. That my heart have comfort. Give us a chance to ask those questions. And uh, Maryam alayhi salam, she was a strong believer. The best woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Nisa al alameen. Elevated her above all the women of the world. Yet when she was giving birth, what did she say? Qalat ya laytani mitu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasiyam mansiyya. I wish I was dead and forgotten. She didn't have problem in the spirituality, have an emotional issue. For you have to differentiate between emotional issue and a spiritual issue. And in order to have a proper care for a new Muslim, you have to understand the shift they have done is big. You know, sometimes when you go to water and you test the water with your feet, this is what's called a heart. The new Muslim, they jumped into, into the water. We had the Muslims sometimes who are feet in the water. They jump. And therefore, they need that kind of support from all of us. That in order for us really to invite people to Islam, there are three things make people stay away from Islam. Especially in minority. That I'm going to be very frank with you. Minorities do not accept Islam in the majority Muslim country for three reasons. Number one, when they're being treated by somebody as second class citizens. Number two, when people don't open their home for them to come and socialize with them. Number three, by not understanding who they are and they speak them in the proper level of the like if somebody highly intellectual person needs somebody to respect that you know don't don't talk down to people that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you know my father rahimahullah was a da'iyah in Sudan he used to say there's something in usul al fiqh called mafhum al mukhalafa you understand things by their opposite Allah said beautiful preaching that means it's ugly preaching huh it's preaching but it's ugly Haram, this and that, and kafir and fasik. This is an ugly preaching. You don't smile on people's face. Why are you frowning? I'm religious. Really? I'm supposed to, to smile all the time. There's some people, after they become religious, they become very mean. <laughs> I don't know if you know, you have that in Malaysia, but I know that in America. All of a sudden, why is this person not smiling anymore? He become religious. So, suffer Allah and Rasul Salah we used to smile all the time. What's happened to you? Anyway, I hope I answered the question. Okay, Alhamdulillah. We uh, come to an end basically. But before that, I would like to ask last one time if there is another last final questions. Burning. Uh, burning questions. Yeah, please, Brother Shahir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I want to uh, ask a uh, uh, advice from uh, panel about uh, can you advise especially for the young men uh, to be motivated in uh, the dakwah 
through our long journey. Um, first of all, young people lead change in every society. They do. And if you want the change really to be sustainable, you have to bring a lot of young people with you. You know, um, in Surah Al-Kahf, a lot talk about young people. You know what are the characteristics of those people? Number one, Amanu Rabbihim. The spiritual aspect of sustaining yourself as a da'iyah. You know, when you are in the plane and the flight attendants talk about emergency, he said, if the pressure changes in this plane, we'll have what? Mass drop. And you have to put the mask on you before you put the person next to you. Every day should have a spiritual connection, praying and time, doing the dhikr and so forth. Number two is keeping good company. You have to have an inner circle of people that motivate you. You know, a person is, is in the company or follow the religion of those are close to them. The influence of your circle. Don't be around people who don't motivate you. Drop them like a bad habit. You know? Be around people who encourage you to do what, you know, Fulfill your dreams. Huh? Don't tell your dream to people who don't motivate you. The third, you know, you have to be optimistic. People are not optimistic that they're not supposed to be in this business of Dawa. They believe that the world is collapsing, that the, the situation is horrible, tomorrow will be worse than today, hellfire is coming, you know. You have to believe in the mercy of Allah. And you have to believe that there's hope. Always think the best of Allah. You know? You have to believe that tomorrow is better than today. So they can get up in the morning to say, Inshallah, I will be part of making tomorrow better. Bi'idhnillah. You know? That is what it is. And you have to believe also that you have the resources here in Malaysia, to, big, to do big things. Like Durqan Nain, when he went and met with those people, they said, want you to change the thing for us? He said, no, 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 I'm going to motivate you, but you have it. He said, you have the iron, you have this and that. He put it together for them, but have them to work for it. Sometimes we don't see abundance we have, abundance of resources. And, and, and you have it. For a person must believe in that. The other things I just want to say that, you know what inspired me every day? The stories in Quran. When I read Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling about Yusuf alayhi salam, the man that his own family went against him, his own brothers, was sold into slavery, was put in prison, false accusation, then he rises to the occasion. You have to believe in that. You know why in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah made the, those young guys to sleep for 309 years? By the way, you know why 309? Why 309? Why? Do you know? One of them solar calendar, the other lunar calendar. Every 100 years, you have three years extra lunar calendar. If you are 33 year old solar calendar, you are actually 34. Because there's 11 days difference. For Allah mentioned both calendar, the 300 and nine. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let them wake up for after 309 years and then go to the city? What do you want them to see? When them to see the change. You start things today, 
it might have impact 300 years later. But you should always believe your effort will not go to waste. Things will, will happen. That's why in America, I tell American Muslims, don't be in despair. Despair is, be, meaning despair is prohibited. Do not, if you do that, only those who disbelieve in God Almighty, they, uh, they are in despair. But be optimistic. Do the right thing and look to the horizon. You see that horizon before your eyes that inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make things happen. I hope that is, uh, was helpful. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I think uh, we are so glad and happy to hear the discussions and sharing from Imam Muhammad Majid on the topic that we are discussing today on the future of Islam and Muslim in the United States and the lesson from Malaysia. On top of the issues that mentioned by our beloved Imam, where in respecting the local lands, culture, and so on, but also Islam, we play its role at the highest level, where Islam is compatible to everywhere and places whereby we also need to understand the text, context, and how to apply it in the between text and context, but not manipulate it. I think that is a big reminder to us that in, in between of understanding the text and all the things, teachings uh, from the Islamic way, for example, but we also need to be careful about the presence of the Muslim society today, where most of uh, today that we have a so complex, but we also need to understand their mixed feelings and so on, so that we also can counter or can deal with those situations in the Islamic way, inshallah. Later on, Islam will play its role as a beautiful teachings and also produce a beautiful acts, kindness and worship, inshallah. So I think uh, I would like to say thank you to all participants here who present here in the office of, uh, of Abib office as well as those who listen to us uh, in the online platform. Thank you for all the questions. I think uh, all the note from Imam we will take, bring home to make it into action, inshallah. Especially uh, we learn from the history of US, the way how Islam developed, the way how Islam flourished, but also in the context of between minority and majority, there is not a big issue. Unless you have efforts, you have uh, determines to do that, inshallah, Islam will be looked again as a great religion and we also will become a great nation, inshallah. So with that, I think I would like to say thank you to Imam Muhammad Majib uh, for your time, for your presence here. Alhamdulillah, we feel honored and glad to have you here. I think this is remarks the achievement of uh, the way how Abim started year 2024, where we have, uh, this is second series of Abim Global Forum that we talk about the global issues. Hopefully, inshallah, at the end, from this discussion, it will enlighten us to understand and understand about our responsibility that we have to work for our people at local level as well as we need to reflect on the global level, inshallah. So, once again, thank you. But I'll be informed that before we end, uh, we have a token of appreciation, uh, appreciation for you. So, I think I just wanted to go flow I would like to invite our Sek Jain, Brother Ali Imran, to hand the talk.